And that's where we're going. The sun and ocean, we're all aware, and if, you, if we go into word association, you say southern ocean, I immediately think of um, Steinlager II and Peter Blake sailing down there. But the southern ocean is playing an incre incredibly important role in modulating climate change at the moment. And what is the southern ocean? Well, it is what you want it to be. Climate scientists tend to look at the Southern Ocean as something along south of latitude 30 degrees. For the reason is that part of the ocean is soaking up more heat and more carbon dioxide from human induced emissions. If you're going to, um, if you're an oceanographer, you'd say, well, whoops, let me get this one first, there we go. If you're an oceanographer, you'd say, well, it's running along here, takes a kink around here, and off to the east. That's the sub subtropical front, and it's an ocean boundary between subtropical water in the north and subantarctic water to the south. If you're a purist, you'll simply say it's 60 degrees. But whatever boundary you take, New Zealand has a major presence. I've just sketched in the exclusive economic zone, which is recognized under the United Nations law and convention of, of, of the oceans. And then we get down to this big wedge, which we used to call the Ross Dependency and probably still do, that is part of the Antarctic Treaty system. So apart from a little bit of open ocean here, international waters, which in fact is a little bit narrower than that because there's some submerged parts of New Zealand extend down there. But you can see New Zealand has some responsibility under the United Nations Convention and on the Antarctic Treaty System for a big chunk of real estate. How does it work? That's how it works. You have Antarctica and you have this east to west current system flying around it. I call it a system because it's composed of a series of fast flowing jets. Here we have the polar front and the southern Antarctic front. And this is the big guy on the block. It's the planet's longest current. It carries the most water, 135 million cubic meters per second, which is absolutely meaningless to you until, until I tell you that that's the annual production globally of Coca-Cola, which is equally meaningless. But if, you could imagine, if you could imagine standing there and watching a year's production of Coke go past your eyes every second, then if you're allergic to Coke, you're in dead trouble. So what we have, this remarkable flow flowing from west to east, soaking up 70% of the wind that falls on the ocean. Soaking up a big chunk of the CO2 we emit, and soaking up about 40% of the extra heat we've generated uh, through indirectly through carbon uh, emissions. Let's put it in the context of the planet. Here's that current. Now this is not a promotion for the Excellent Compensation Commission. I'm sure they need it, but I'm not going to do it for them. That's the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. That was that current system you saw flowing from west to east. And what happens in the yellow stars is that water becomes super cold, becomes salty, and becomes dense and sinks to depth and moves under the effect of its density, under the effects of winds, under the effects of turbulence, into the Pacific. It rises, comes back by the tropics, gathering heat all the while, moves into the Atlantic, Gulf Stream, Atlantic Current, and then starts to lose heat to keep Europe warm. It loses heat to the point that it becomes denser sinks along with cold water in the Labrador Sea, returns to Antarctica for recharge. 
with this whole loosely linked system of ocean currents, Antarctica is the dominant partner for the North Atlantic. So the two main fueling centers, North Atlantic and Antarctica, and this is the dominant one. So you start to get a feel for the role that the Southern Ocean is playing. This great system of currents which is taking, which is moving heat, salt, because salt is important <coughs> for regulating density, nutrients, gases around the planet. We're now going to get to the substance of this, in that that little ship you saw was sailing through all that stuff. We go through patches of icebergs, and the big patches of icebergs were where the ice was captured in those fast flowing current systems. So it all started to take on a sense of reality when you looked over the side of a, of a heated ship. The Southern Ocean is warming. If it's soaking up the heat generated by anthropogenic, by human uh, caused emissions, it must be warming, and indeed it is. It's warming to a depth of at least 3,000 meters. And what Dan will show you a little later on with these automated drifting floats that are passing around the ocean, they're actually measuring the gain in heat from the increased CO2 motivated contents in the atmosphere. Because you're heating water, you're expanding it. And surprise, surprise, this heating and expansion, roughly about 30% of sea level rise. The ocean's getting fresher. So, around the margins of Antarctica, and I'll emphasize the margins, not necessarily the interior, but around the margins of Antarctica, the ice is melting, it's adding fresh water to the ocean, and so the ocean becomes less salty. The significance of this is captured in this picture here. We have Observation Hill, the famous cross which is facing south, where the land party for Scott used to go up every day and observe to see if they could see Scott and his party coming back. A century ago this year. And we have here the Ross Ice Shelf. And in the normal world, we are here in the, uh, the western Ross Sea. In the eastern Ross Sea, water flows in, passes around this vast ice shelf, and I use the word vast quite deliberately. It's roughly the size of Spain, not France, but Spain. And the water flows becomes super cold. As it comes out of this part of the ocean, it's about minus 1.7 to minus 2 degrees. In winter, we get sea ice, it expels salt. And since the last two slides you were doing Oceanography 101, but you don't know it, but you'll be tested afterwards, mm -hmm. that salt and temperature regulate the density. And so, when it gets super cold, when you add salt from the growing seas, that water becomes dense and sinks. Now, with the melting ice and the ocean becoming warmer, its density is changing very slightly. So the tendency to sink is reduced also very slightly. Ice shelves are retreating. About six so far, and they're going. The Ross Ice Shelf, the largest of the largest, is retreating at about five meters per annum. Spectacularly, we had the Larsen B, which everybody tends to show. In 2002, it started to break up, and then catastrophically, in April, it had this big discharge. This is in April and it's refreezing, but in essence, we had a massive breakout, all within a matter of a few <coughs> weeks. There's the new shoreline, that was the previous shoreline. 
Why this caught people's imagination was it was rapid. What we know from the geology is by looking at the sediments underneath that ice shelf, this is the first time this collapse has occurred in 12,000 years. And so these things are responding, and they're responding to two things. We talked about the ocean warming. Well, the ocean is nibbling away at Antarctica, going, moving under these ice shelves, melting them from below. That seems to be the prime driver. But we've also got atmospheric warming, and these cracks you see here, they open up, milked water goes down them, and water, of course, is denser than ice, as your gin and tonic with an ice cube will tell you. Mm -hmm. The water goes down and starts to force that crack wider. If that water freezes, it expands and forces the crack wider still. So, with a warmer ocean, the ice shelves and parts are collapsing, and parts like the Ross Ice Shelf, they were treated. Sea ice, com si, com sa. In some areas it says it has increased, in some areas it has reduced. Overall, there's been the slightest of increases. I mentioned that the Southern Ocean takes up carbon dioxide by waters becoming gasified and sinking. When we look at Antarctica overall, the jury is out as to whether it's stopped or reducing this take up of heat, of take up CO2. But what we're seeing is that <coughs> the conditions are right for that uptake to reduce <coughs> for two reasons. A, the ocean's warmer, and warm water doesn't take up so much carbon dioxide as cold water. And secondly, it's affecting the growth of plankton. Plant plankton takes up carbon and sinks and they release that carbon en route or go straight to the seabed. <coughs> but the production of plankton in the Southern Ocean is declining or at least changing over time. It's changing because the winds have migrated south. The strong core of the westerly winds, living in Wellington, I find this hard to believe, but trust me, <laughs> that the, Welling the, not the Wellington winds, but the strong <laughs> westerly winds have migrated about 120 kilometers south. They've done the same in the uh, northern hemisphere, they've moved north, in response to atmospheric <coughs> heat. And so the strong winds lie south, and they sit right over our Antarctic circumpolar current, and are forcing it. They're forcing the current to become either more turbulent, or faster, or both. This is a tribute to a guy going out with a thermometer, taking a water sample and measuring the salt content. They've been doing it for, since 1944 off Maria Island in Tasmania. And what they found is that the subtropics in this part of the world, at least, <coughs> are expanding. <coughs> Normally we get this. We have warm water from the equator and <coughs> Australia splitting, some going north, some going south, coming across New Zealand and moving off towards the east. It's basically the hot tap. <coughs> Since 1944, what we've seen is this. <coughs> That flow has extended, 1944 has extended 350 kilometers south. And the subtropical organisms within it are following that current. Just a straight observation. And the waters around Tasmania have warmed to about nearly 2 degrees over that 44 year, uh, so since 1944, over that 68 year period. Quite a remarkable change, but it is happening literally before our eyes. What interests us as New Zealanders is, is this extension forcing some decline in this trans-Tasman current here bringing the warm water to New Zealand. At the moment, we don't see that ch uh, change. I'll only touch on this. 
But with that little movie promo, you couldn't help but be captivated by the marine animals that we saw, terrestrial and marine animals. Quite remarkable. You go and walk amongst penguins in their thousands. But many of these charismatic megafauna, fabulous term, it means cuddly animals, <laughs> they, quite a few of them are in decline. These are sea lions from end of the island in the Auckland Islands, and their numbers have reduced to the point now that in uh, this part of the, uh, the Southern Antarctic Islands, the sea lions number less than 10,000. What a remarkable decline from their numbers, which I think probably numbered in the hundreds of thousands, at least. The knee-jerk reaction is, what caused this? And the first thing is, well, it may not be climate change. It may be related to fishing. It may be related to a specific type of fishing. The answers to why animals decline are somewhat complex. Don't get me wrong, they have to be tackled. Rock hopper penguins, since about the 1940s, have declined dramatically. That's an important date which should give you some clue. Because in the 1940s, large scale commercial fishing in the Southern Ocean really hadn't hit its straps at all. It was still the big unknown ocean. So in 1944, bearing in mind what we saw happen in Australia, 1944, we may be seeing a change in plankton, possibly reflecting those winds moving south, stirring up the water, taking those bugs down to depths that they can't photosynthesize. So there's a whole lot going on, but these are key questions which we, we do have to tackle. Off New Zealand, we're getting what we think are changes in the plankton. This is rather a nice mixture of recent studies and geological studies. This was Christmas two, a couple of years ago. We started to get these big algal blooms over the eastern seaboard. And some work at Niwa, Ho Chang went out and saw that they were little calcareous made out of calcite plankton, called a copper. When we look at the seabed, we see the modern layer of mud is mainly composed of animal parts. It's brown, sandy, and it's mainly the fossil remains of animal plants. Then you drop immediately to a sub-layer of which can only be called the white cliffs of Dover. That chalky, um, it used to be chalk actually, when we were kids, used to get uh, layers of chalk, which were composed of cockliths, basically a layer of this white limestone. The last time that happened was the last major warm period we had when ocean temperatures were about one to two degrees. So from the seabed, we know these changes occur, that we switch from animal-based plankton to plant-based plankton. And what the satellite observations are showing is that it's happening potentially before our eyes. So, just to sum up, there's a lot going on in the Southern Ocean. It's become warmer and fresher, which means in parts it's less dense, particularly in, the, particularly in those sinking areas. Sea level is rising because of this thermal expansion, because of ice melting off uh, terrestrial ice bodies. It's become windier, and so the waves have increased and the production of plankton has changed. The currents, like the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, with that wind shift sitting right over the sky, have become stronger in a sense they may be faster or more turbulent. They're acidifying very slightly, and Robin Murdoch will talk about this process, primarily because they're taking up carbon dioxide, which we know from that old trick, if you had a rusty bolt, you'd leave it in the bottle of coke overnight, and in the morning the rust had gone. God knows what it did to your stomach. But that's carbonic acid in the Coca-Cola, sort of dissolving that effect. So we do get generate carbon, carbonic acid in the oceans, and that is causing a, a, an overall 
small but significant increase. Ice shelves are retreating. Are we getting more icebergs? We don't know. You remember the iceberg in 2006 that came off Dunedin? Everybody got excited. That was shearing sheep. People were booked up to get married on it. We were quite a stylish group, New Zealanders. <laughs> and of course, the media latched on to this by saying that Antarctica was going to hell in a handcart. But that was not the case. Because when you go back in uh, historical sailing ship records, early steamship records, icebergs have been a part of southern New Zealand well before <coughs> the current phase of warming. And of course, biota, in other words, the plants and animals are affected by this warming too. Lessons from the past. What I've showed you is happening in a world which last month in 396 parts per million carbon dioxide has measured at Mauna Loa and has measured at Bering Head. I've just started a group of students, uh, fourth year students on a project, and they will graduate with their masters. And I said, when you graduate in 2014, there'll be 400 parts per million. Now that's a very symbolic change, but nonetheless an important change that in a couple of years time we move into a 400 parts per million world. What does this mean? What can we do? What's the consequences? Well, we can go back to the past and see what happened the last time we were in the 400 parts per million world. Now, those levels, obviously, we're going back uh, three to five million years ago, there wasn't much human activity around, and it reflected Earth's natural state at the time. We do shift, we have shifted in the past to quite extreme levels of carbon dioxide. And we've gradually, stepwise, come out of that. And over the last million years, what we, at least the last million years, we've gone through this regular cycle of ice ages and warm periods. And we know the level of carbon dioxide, and the levels we see now are the highest, by that 34% that we see compared to those recorded back a million years ago in the ice core record. So what have we got here? Well, the last time, three to five million years ago, the Earth, 400 parts per million. And in 2006, we drilled through the Ross Ice Shelf. You can see it's a classic shelf, water coming in underneath, and through the seabed to get a record of this ice sheet moving backwards and forwards. When it moves forwards, you can remember, if you take your mind back to trips to the Fox or the Franz Josef Glacier, it's a bulldozer on the seabed, or in that case, the valley floor, grinding up sediment to produce these brown layers. It's basically simply ground up rock. When it starts to melt, it produces a lot of mud, a mud layer. And as it melts more, this will retreat back, the ice shelf will be replaced by ocean, you get plankton coming down. So you get this fantastic cycle. Here we are in an ice age, ice is on the bottom, grinding that rock away, it starts to lift off, produce all that mud, Melting continues, we have open ocean at the site, full of plankton. The biggest event we saw was back about two, let's say three million years around the figures. And the whole of that sediment core was replaced by open ocean plankton. As best we can measure, that was a 400 parts per million world conditions we have today. But the Ross Ice Shelf had gone. All this was open ocean. For an ice shelf to be there in the first place, you need glaciers. <coughs> and those glaciers come in, reach the open ocean, they merge to form the ice shelf. It really is just an extension of the terrestrial glaciers. And we have 
at the backs of our minds quite seriously, in fact, that if the Ross Ice Shelf goes, the glaciers that feed it will take off. And so the West Antarctic ice sheet, the smaller of the big ice sheets, will become destabilized, and that will immediately give us three to three and a half meters of sea level rise. Now, I use the term immediately as a geologist. <laughs> immediately means a lot of things. But the modeling we have to date is suggesting that if the Ross Ice Shelf goes, and the geological evidence saying it has gone in the past, particularly in this 400 parts per million world, it took the West Antarctic Ice Sheet about 300 to 400 years to disintegrate and add to sea level rise. Now that's a model. It's just giving you a possibility. It may not be the truth, but it gives you something to think about and to sort of test. And that's what we change from. We can say, this is the modern system here for our glacier coming in, including uh, the Ross, uh, Ross Ice Shelf. We've got some winter ice over here. In a 400 parts per million world, this is what this re recreation suggests Antarctica will look like. Possibly minus the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, probably with three to three and a half meters of sea level rise from Antarctica alone. When I hear this stuff, it's like when I hear the news in the morning, I say, good God, why should I bother getting out of bed? What the hell can I do about it? And quite frankly, the stuff can be quite overwhelming. There's so much going on. When you look at the weather-related uh, weather events just in the last few days, those dreadful floods in Japan, 400 millimetres of rain dropping in Fjordland, heat waves in America, Heat waves, 41, 42, 43 degrees centigrade, stretching across from the mid-US out to the east. So the problems are large, and so the question is, how do we tackle them? I, I don't have any real answers for that. You can do it at a personal level, trying to keep your carbon footprint reasonable. I try, and sometimes I fail spectacularly. I'm off to a conference next week. How are you getting there? I'm flying. Okay. Um, but as best one can is to keep one's own carbon footprint to a minimum. There's an intermediate step, which I tend to favour because you get fairly instant results. And Gareth Morgan has latched onto this with a million dollar mouse. And that is pest eradication can make a major difference to those sort of emerald jewels we have in the south. And I'll show you why. That's Macquarie Island. This is not mice, this is rabbits. And they've denuded the landscape, and those used to be the foundation of tussock grass. You can see the rabbit burrows, you can see the moss forming, and that's just rabbits. In other parts of uh, Macquarie Island, where they've had started to re-establish their vegetation, to get from those bare tussocks to this, it's cost them off the top of the head about six million Australian dollars. They're getting rid of rabbits. And okay, they're dropping bait, but it makes this, in other words, the return of the sanctuary. And although indirectly related to climate change, once you start creating these sanctuaries, like Antipodes Island, and Antipodes Island was discussed in considerable detail, what would be the best thing to do, you start to make a difference. And I think I, I can sort of see where I'm heading. For a million dollars for Antipodes Island, we will create what is happening, what was happening on Macquarie Island, will make a difference, a big difference.
for a modest amount of money and you'll see the results within your lifetime. To me, that has some appeal because at least it's a first step and you've got something tangible to show for it. And I think this is a rather nice part to end on. Those who saw the documentary will recognize this piece, but here the background is set to opera, not orchestral. 